And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, making his way all the way, all the way back up from the land of Wonderfilled, the one and only... See, the one, only Stephen E. Dinehart the Fourth. How you doing today, man? Well, thanks. Uh, glad to be back in the temple with you, Mildred. Glad to glad to have you back in. Um, it's it's certainly it's certainly been a hot a hot minute or two since I've had since I've had you on. Um, yeah, it seems it seems like ages. I mean, it was just a little over a year ago, but it, it mm -hmm. seems like eons almost. Um, I do remember. I do remember. Um. I do remember. I do remember. Er, I do remember in the in that in that time frame, Ernie getting on you for sounding like you were coming out of a radio. Oh right. Um, you mean in, in recording? I don't. I don't yeah, oh, that was okay. that was his comment, and I was like, "Look, every everybody has a different everybody has a different setup. Some people are going to come clearer than others." Um, when I had when I had Biohazard on, he was all, he was all the way out in the boat. Using a sat fo using Zoom on a sat phone, so <laughs> I, so I put I had to put a comment on I had to pin a comment at the top saying I apologize in advance for the robotic noises. He was in the middle of the ocean on a friggin' boat. Yeah, I actually, I didn't sound too bad to me. I was, uh, I, you know, for some reason you your voice levels were lower. But anyway, we don't mm -hmm. need to pick it. But yeah, it was uh, it was fun to 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 revisit that, and it's especially because you know. Sometimes when you're in the the roles of uh, uh, you know the woes, I guess of uh, production, mm -hmm. you know you sort of forget those those moments, and it's it's kind of fun to look back at you know where I was, I guess a little over a year ago at this mm -hmm. project compared to where we are now. Yeah. Um. And I, um. And you've been and as I rec as I recall, you had, you've mentioned to me that um, Giant Lance has been has been something that you've been that you've been work that you've been tooling around with for three years. Yeah, I mean, so the universe is one I began developing a long time ago. And, you know, I haven't, you know, like worked on it full time since I was sort of developed. I pitched, uh, you know, a, you know, a few different games at various different uh, points in the timeline of the universe, a feature film. I tried to get going at one point. So it was already kind of a lot there uh, when we decided to pick it up. But yeah, a little, uh, you know, I mean, at this point, it was in earnest two years ago we announced the project actually at gen con was where we first kicked it off mm -hmm. and i think the first date when i sort of mentioned it uh, online was uh, july 17th about two years ago um but yeah i mean i have you know been thinking about it um at least what it's become now mm -hmm. probably um you know about eight months prior to that so yeah we're getting pretty close to really three years and then i thought it won't be until the spring um and but yeah i came off the heels of uh, you know developing a live action role playing game park uh with evermore mm -hmm. and uh wanted to uh, deliver um well, something better and uh, something that um really played to my own sensibilities as someone that kind of grew up in the midwest uh, loving the rpg mm -hmm. so um giant lands um yeah is is really really been the boat to, to carry me there and you know we've been <laughs> we got so caught up in this rpg which is the core of it mm -hmm. um it's it's you know but just a, just really just a piece of it but i really am trying to do it do it right and to do it really with that that spirit of mojo that you know created these kinds of games with the hope that giant lands is just just that kind of game so that uh we can uh, you know, build a, a living world around it that people can actually enter. Yeah, and when it comes to the, when it comes to the whole, the whole, do, the whole doing doing things old school thing, I um I will I will make a bit of a confession in that I have a complicated relationship with the with the mindset of old school play, especially the whole yeah. um, OSR yeah. thing. Yeah, it's really weird, man. I didn't realize what I was jumping into, and it's kind of fun listening to some of our old, when, you know, listening to our conversations about it because I think it actually came up in our conversation, mm -hmm. and that was probably just you know, not too. I don't know. I wasn't even familiar with the term OSR when I started on this, yeah. and then I thought I thought it was a good marketing term. I thought maybe oh, okay, this represents people that are interested 
and you know what i'll say is you know more old school tabletop rpgs like i didn't really i you know i don't know it's all everything's so drenched in politics these days it's really sort of disturbing for me quite frankly you want to know uh, the ultimate irony I, so, I somehow ended up becoming a controversial figure a couple times oh, by no. declaring that i would not be, i had no desire to be a controversial figure <laughs> I, bas I basically I basically reiterated the pol the policy that I've had with my te with my temple since day one. Um, we are not a we are not a bunch of professionals here. We're assholes. <laughs> We're assholes who happen to like games, drinking, and games about drinking. <laughs> and I haven't played a good drinking game in a long mm -hmm. time. It used to be so much fun. Mm -hmm. Um. I usually I usually keep a few bottles of bacon soda just just so, in case. So yeah, I need to what I what, you know what I was referring to there is not so much like oh I'm you know trying to you know mm -hmm. not take the knee or whatever people keep saying which I still don't understand. Um, but um, you know I was just for me it's a spirit of development. You know I'm a professional entertainer. Mm -hmm. I work in studios that produce these goods that people love. So for me what's important isn't um necessarily the mindsets associated mm -hmm. with the projects so much as the spirit that went into creating those processes or those projects products excuse me and mm -hmm. trying to in some ways kind of mimic the process as best i can i mean i know we're not you know uh you know my team's virtual um you know my editor is working today uh, uh penny williams she's fantastic um jim is working today i am working today um, I think that's about it on the team that's actually doing stuff currently. So it's all virtual. It's mm -hmm. not quite the same, but yeah, you know, just trying to, you know, my sensibilities as a game developer um, are very different from people that started making games in the 70s, particularly board games and tabletop games. Mm -hmm. So it's been, um, you know, and I, I'm working with people that at least for a long time I idolized. So um, I try to be respectful and am genuinely interested in how they develop things mm -hmm. and to try that, you know, I like to think by learning how they d did it, that maybe we can sort of capture some of that magic uh, into the products that we made. Not that they're necessarily, you know, aligned with, you know, particular views or systems even mm -hmm. uh, from uh, past products. Yeah, that's. If there's if there's one mis if there's one mistake that I th that I think I ma that I think I made in my early research um, on Giant Lands, mm -hmm. it was it was it was associating it on some level as as a um, spiritual successor slash retro clone of um, Gamma World, and right. while the, while there's certain overlaps if you were to put the two of them on a Venn diagram, I get the I get the feeling that as as time has gone on and and the project has um, gained more and more of its footing, mm -hmm. um, it started to it it may have it may have the giant um, Gamma World may have been the inspiration, but it's not. But it hasn't um, been solely le leaning that way. With no, time. well, I mean, Gamma World was the inspiration for me in the eighties, mm -hmm. right? Um, I love Jim's games more than Gary's games. Um, and I tried to imitate those games from an early age. I don't have too much left but a character sheet. I'm not sure who played with me. Um, but there was a game that I created that was my own version of Gamma World when I was probably, I don't know, 11 or 12 um, that I ran with my friends. And it was very similar it has some themes that are sort of uh, closer related to Giant Lands, but yeah, it's very much inspired out of that. So it's, um, you know, I like to think that um, it's it's still has some of that Gamma World essence in it, and particularly because Jim is designing so much, and we've been trying to bring some of that love. I really wish um, Kim, uh, my initial advisor on the project, who did so much great work uh, in the Gamma universe, uh, was still around to assist us. Mm -hmm. um but um yeah it's a it's it's not gamma and um it, in the sense for me it's like a, a revisiting of gamma um and making it a bit more mystical like mm -hmm. as you mentioned uh and uh you know bringing more fantasy element but when i say fantasy i'm not 
uh, speaking of European fantasy, I'm really trying to create, you know, a new sort of really an American uh, fantasy that's um, kind of draws on a lot of mythos. So Gamma, you know, it's shipped with that great map of like, you know, the post-apocalyptic United States. So, you know, fans will be happy when they receive, you know, a box with a map, which we haven't announced, which I'm mentioning here, I guess, that'll <laughs> ship in the box um, that, you know, is reminiscent of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is it is a different world uh, than Gamma. More, you know, I would say the, the one of the biggest things for me, although there's all kinds of uh, elements we could look at, is that it's not a post-nuclear Holocaust game. So... You know, I grew up loving all that stuff, mm -hmm. um, but um, that's just not part of the, the mythology here. Interestingly enough, though, it's um, in some ways, although now it seems like, you know, hey, they're just following the pandemic, probably. It was all about Mother Nature sort of rising up against humanity for treating the Earth like crap mm -hmm. and um, uh, throwing our civilization to waste um, and sort of, uh, you know, just like an Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> You know, and um, all bets are off and uh, all these forces from around uh, the multiverse really are uh, trying to take Earth back uh, for their own sake. And so it's sort of up to us or up to players to uh, determine the course of where that goes. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's some influences, um, but, uh, you know, I, I would say that, you know, it's also influenced by a range of uh, material. I mean, I really tried to go back and look at the stuff that influenced um, James and the like. I mean, if you ever go back at the old TSR stuff, they always mm -hmm. come with these great lists of books you should read, right? Yeah, the old Appendix N thing. Yeah, if you want more stuff like this, go check it out, you know. And um, so I tried to look at a lot of that material and really try to understand, you know, the the – I don't know the the culture i guess the um that was there at the time that brought them to make this sort of game um and you know a big part for me that i think i like about it um is that it's not a different place mm -hmm. it's it's here in the future um uh, but we're not you know talking about a different universe we're not talking about some distant past that may or may not have exist existed you know i'm proposing that the future could be more magical and um, that you can be anyone you want there. And so let's let's figure out what we're going to do at, when none of these systems work anymore. Because we can see right now a lot of them are failing for us. And it's clear as, as a species, um, we're going to need to rethink a lot about how we coexist. Mm -hmm. Now, the other th the one of the things that what, you touched on something that I find that I find kind of interesting. And and that is the fact that you're going with essentially a ma essentially a magical apocalypse, which even with even with the amount of stuff that I've gone through in my library is not a road that's very often traveled. I think I've I think I've only seen that done maybe four maybe four or so times. Putting aside that the the fact that most most apocalyptic fiction that I have, whether it be RPGs or otherwise, is squarely in science fiction. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah it's science fiction it's, it's usually driven out of sort of sci-fi devices again whether it's the nuclear bomb um you know there was other projects i did in the past that tried to make it more science-based like you know the 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 polar uh, the magnetic poles shift and you know all this stuff and um but yeah yeah i mean uh for me mysticism is important and um it's something that i um, all my life I've, I've been able to sort of express, to be honest. And um, I like the idea of having a space where it's um, safe to express and explore those things. Um, well, you're, you're in good company as far as, as, far as being, a des being a game designer expo exploring mysticism since, um, <laughs> um, St since Stafford wasn't too far off on that, on that front since he was a full-on shaman. Right. Um. But the but, like the clo the closest th when it comes to TSR's library, the closest I can think of to anything close to a magical apocalypse is Dark Sun, and even that's me really stretching it. Yeah, that's stretching it. See, I mean, there, yeah, some people at one point like 
you know, started coming at me hard. I don't know. It's, you know, about you know these accounts on various social accounts. I've, I've I kind of had it up to here with, with anonymous social accounts these days. And they come from all directions. And sometimes I engage, sometimes I don't. But at one point there, people were uh, coming after me saying, oh, well, you know, trying to attack Jim and um, the claim that um, this is, you know, I mean, what's he, what's he saying? He's like, you know, the first po- post-apocalyptic um science fantasy ttrpg or something like that and you know that may or may not be true but you know the truth is jim um really did uh, create this stuff and you know and they go and they gra- try to grab these other things so dark sun's a great example i love dark sun i always oh, yeah. love sun you know is next to gamma it's my favorite mm-hmm. right so you could you, i mean there's definitely dark sun influences in here but you know dark sun takes place on a plate in athos right mm-hmm um, and as far as I recall, it has nothing to do with our, our timeline as well, right? I mean, it's a totally different universe, which is great. That's cool. Um, but yeah, this is different. We're talking about planet Earth. Now, th- given given the, given that, um, that bring that brings that brings one obvious question that I have. That's kind of a bit of an elephant in the room sitting on my couch. I really need to do something <laughs> about that. Um, might have to might have to get a catapult or something. You know anybody who sells arbalest without a permit? <laughs> oh, asking for a friend. Right, right. And science, obviously. Um, but how? But since you're since you're dealing with Earth, Soul th- Soul Three as it as it were, um, how do you? That's obviously going to be a familiar setting for reasons I don't feel. I don't feel I need to go into, but how do you how do you make the how do you make the world around us um, feel magical? Well, I think it is magical. I mean, that's sort of the whole premise of the name of my company, even Wonder Filled. And um, after you know, particularly previously in you know different incarnations I've had over this lifetime, I focused purely on uh, digital. Um, and would be making virtual experiences. And in recent years, I've gone from making mixed reality experiences to, uh, I don't even know what to call it, alternate reality experiences. I mean, Evermore had almost no tech involved, mm-hmm. uh, particularly from a dig- digital standpoint. It was very much, like, I like to say, pen and paper, all practical effects. Um, and... Uh, what I um, get so disheartened by these days is how little magic uh, so many people seem to see in the world. And so many things have kind of become cold and lost mystery. But I know that mystery still exists inside us and we have a real need for it. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so I, I think that uh, by um, you know giving us a space uh, where we can explore this stuff um, in a healthy way, um, where it's invited, is sort of you know I, I, I I've, got, I've gotten in trouble for using this world word but or term, but I really believe in it, creating a safe space um, for people to explore these things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think RPGs were always a safe space for me and my friends, and I'm talking from like in elementary school, you know we were a bunch of outcasts and nerds um at an after school program that when all the other kids would go outside to like run around on the playground we'd sit in a room and look at books right oh. um, and, and roll dice and um it we did that because we felt safe there because we felt like we weren't going to get attacked by the other kids and when we went to that space we spoke a special language mm-hmm. really that only our friends spoke yeah. And that was the language of the, the RPG, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, there in the RPG, we could be different people. We could do things other people said we couldn't do. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I really believe in that idea that it is a safe space. So I want to create a space um, where it's safe to explore these things. And people can say, yeah, I am a mystical being, right? And it's not necessarily attached to any particular dogma. Uh, I'm not a big fan of dogma. I think it's fun to play with dogma. Um, and, um, you know, I invite people to kind of, you know, my hope really is that people look at themselves, um, and, you know, who they are, 
not only in the contemporary, but what they've come from. You know, we're all built on the backs of so many thousands of individuals um, mm. that have died before us. And I think we owe it to them uh, to make the future a better place, as well as to, you know, our children, our children's children and all that jazz. Oh. So, um, you know, I would love people to bring their own mythos uh, into this world and to explore them and remix them. Um, because I think we, as we move forward as a species, we're really going to need these things again. And, you know, science is always kind of coming back to this idea, whether it's the God particle or, or whatever it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't, again, I don't want to be evangelical, um, uh, but, um, yeah, I like the idea that the world is more magical and um, showing it to people, helping them to, to uh, see that. Um, and I know that, you know, forgive me, I kind of um, meandered on this response, but, um, I am a magic maker and I know how to reveal that to people sometimes. It takes a lot of work um, and I don't get a lot of credit for it sometimes um, because when people experience my things, they don't necessarily relate it to me, mm -hmm. um, but I can see it. And when I take witness to it and I can see that transformation just from even something simple from someone that didn't have a smile is now smiling and engaged with the world. That's huge. That ma that makes me feel happy. There's this moment, I think, I don't know, maybe we talked about it in, in our previous show. Uh, one of my uh, most important moments as a game designer and as a creator was this uh, time when uh, uh, a family came to Evermore Park and um, on entry, um, they're all kind of given these sort of character sheets um, where they're supposed to sort of figure out who they're going to be for that day. And, you know, they get this sort of welcome call as they kind of step through the portal and into Evermore. And uh, these character sheets we call passports. But anyway, this little girl got it. And it's all kind of pen and paper. You're just sort of supposed to fill it out on the spot. Not a lot of rules, just more of a mental exercise. Mm -hmm. And um, she understood right away. And I could tell um, by this, she just kind of became alive all of a sudden and knew in that moment she could be whoever she wanted. And she went right to it and was asking people, Oh, who are we going to be? What do you want to be? What are we going to do? And, um, that made me cry, frankly, because, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking for. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's magical. Um, so many people, you know, uh, I still remember a talk I used to give when I was a professor. I don't know how much there is anymore, but remember that whole, like, I'm bad at life meme thing. And somewhat, and it, and, it, and it, people were really focused on, oh, well, I'm a, you know, it's this, you sort of see it now with the metaverse, you know, oh, I, I'm a better person there, or, you know, I, I have more effect there, or, you know, my agency is sort of what they're saying is more deep in these virtual worlds than in they are in real life. So I want to help people find agency in real life. And I really believe uh, that um, RPGs help me to find uh, agency in my own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's fun. It's funny you when you mentioned that when you mentioned the whole thing the whole thing with the group of nerds that you're in um some something that putting there's one thing that i've that i've said off off and on especially with my with one of my monikers being a tabletop punk is the is the fact that i think i think it's a bit contradictory for people to for to for people to want to be nerds while at the same time um wanting wanting some sort of conformity or some sort or some sort of acceptance from the outside. When, yeah, right. Cuz well people like you and me, we the what the last thing the last thing that we wanted was was any it was any attention from the outside. We just wanted to be left the hell alone to to the books and the games and the like. Um Yeah. I just yeah, had, I just had the the um the roll of the roll of the dice genetically that I was t that I was taller than everybody else so I so I ended up playing double duty as what as one of the nerds at the table and also the um enforcer at the table right <laughs> um and yeah I've I've been cl I've been clear about the fact that I've that I dabbled in both sports and in and in nerddom because I, because even yeah, cause I, think, I, I think we all did back in the day I mean I was I used to play them all man so. um I did a whole. I did a whole lot of hockey. I did a whole lot of fencing. Um, oh, cool! Well, you're a fencing nerd. That makes so much sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fencing. I'm a fencing nerd who has it. Who has? I tried it. to get a fencing man. They were too hardcore for me. So. Um, I can. 
I'm a I'm a fen I'm a fencing nerd it's who has the thespians, man. I love acting, but yeah. those thespians, man, they just there's the, those clicks were they were just so hardcore. I didn't think I knew enough show tunes for them. Gotta help you if you ever had to work with method actors. <laughs> you oh, know, I love the, method acting. I do it all the time. Dude. I I like it too. I like it too. But I'm sometimes, a big Stella Adler fan. <laughs> but some sometimes sometimes those sometimes method actors can be a little bit hard to work with because oh, yeah. because the whole thing of I'm in character 24 seven even even when even when we're not on stage or in fr or in front of a camera. <laughs> That reminds me the last time. Actually, it was when I was at Gen Con. I mean, you shouldn't bring them up so much. Uh, but uh, I went to Dick's Last Resort. I hadn't been there in years. I, like, and they were all being a jerk to me. And I was like, what is wrong with this place? <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember, oh, right, that's their shtick. Like, why would anyone ever come here? <laughs> mm -hmm. imagine, be, imagine being surprised at, pe at people being mad at you at a place called Dick's. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I was, I was for some. Um, I told I told Ernie this story, but um, I I was that I was that asshole who who um some kids would some kids would try try and, because of my because of my height they try and have me go go into stores to buy cigarettes and I just go I just I just take the money and then go and then go out the then go out the other door and I wouldn't be seen for the rest of the day. <laughs> oh gosh, you're a good boy. Yeah. Yeah that that was that was my hustle for. A, for a while was was um t was taking was taking advantage or sometimes I'll just give I'll just give them the money and say yeah th yeah they wanted me to buy cigs I'm not do I'm not doing it so here's their money do what you want with it <laughs> Oh you're such a good soul now we just go steal cartons Yeah um I would I wouldn't exact I I'm not exactly lawful good I'll put it that way <laughs> Yeah I was yeah I mean I was like a, I mean when I was doing that it was a like sixth grade we were like hanging out in the alley you know I mean no. Yeah but one now on the on the whole thing with magic, um, that brings it. The idea of making things more magical brings a brings a very interesting conundrum because you even if you you look at a lot of um a lot of fan a lot of fantasy no, novels and other and other presentations um over the over the last fifty years and you and you find it taking a lot of different forms. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, with with something like Tolkien, there's the idea that there's this subtle kind of magic that's 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 everywhere, but the really overt stuff is extremely extremely rare. Um, well, and in in some cases, you have you have say the Vance approach, where method where magic is just a really really complex form of mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, you've got you've got um, You've got some cases where there's a lot of where there's a lot of magic all o all over the place. Some where it's some where it's a bloodline thing. A, a whole lot of permutations on this on this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to your interpretation of making a world like Giant Lands feel magical, where do you fit into that particular spectrum? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess I wasn't thinking about it in the context of making Giant Lands magical. I mean, that mm -hmm. that doesn't seem. Um, um, as like as much of a challenge to me so yeah we try not to use the word magic although admittedly the further and further i get with it it's like well why don't like why does it matter um just use but, just use it with a k that's what ours that's what well well that's... And, and that's that's a that's really a big part of the sort of magic that i'm interested in mm -hmm. here and i think that in some ways that um you know i like to think that we're, we're teaching it but in terms of the uh universe itself in the magic systems uh within it um, it's all uh, premised on this idea that in this sort of awakening, uh, where this great uh, ch chasm happened, and you know um, all this chaos uh, was brought about by you know the Earth uh, mm -hmm. essentially uh, revolting against uh, humanity, um, ley lines, uh, which you know is an, an old idea mm -hmm. that are all over the world, um, kind of reemerge, and they're like great rivers of energy and um, there's different types of lay energy all sorts um at the beginning of the game we only start with four types of uh, lay energy mm -hmm. um and they are sort of like you know each one has a different school of magic and each one has sort of an innate quality to it color sound um and um by harnessing these different energies um, you can power uh, different technologies as well as um, 
augment yourself in different ways and have uh, different abilities. So we really wanted it to be magic as technology, um, you know, which, you know, is it, is it too um, novel of an idea? I think my greatest influences um, that come from that are Ralph Bakshi's, is, is forgive me, Ralph Bakshi's Wizards, mm -hmm. um, which I've uh, adored since I discovered it years ago. And, um, you know, the, the thing is in giant lands, I didn't want people running around with, you know, uh, rusty Western guns. Now, you know, that might happen. You know, there are artifacts around, but most of them don't function anymore. Mm -hmm. So most of the technologies we're dealing with are new and, uh, the resource, uh, to keep them functioning, uh, is lay energy. Yeah. And because of, because of... I can understand your hesitance to to use to use the to use the term magic, and I was I was bringing up the whole spelling it with a K thing, partly it's partly, partly, to, partly to, but, but, no, you go ahead. I was bringing up I was bringing that up partly to be a partly to be a smart ass, partly to re to to reference stuff like Ars Magica, but also the also the fact that maybe I'm maybe I'm misreading this, but I get the sense that. One of the big hesitancies with using the term magic is putting is putting the more traditional ideas in someone's head. You know, the the yeah. wizard, the wizard off in mm -hmm. a tower, the yep. the magic non mage um ab yeah, ability well, and, divide, yeah, and, it, and it falls into again what I've been really trying to pull away from is that sort of European fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, and 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 you know, it's fantasy has become monoculture almost, right? And it's there's subtle differences here and there but like this this would speak to why like harry potter does so well i mean there's nothing very original in harry potter but it it kind of pulls from this space that is now european fantasy monoculture um so yeah i'm really trying to step away from that yeah um, i've so um... sometimes that does just require using different words yeah um, I've nicknamed that kind of thing the Tolkien melting pot. Um, mm -hmm. Not that it, not to, not to, not that I'm taking shots at it, at Tolkien or anything like or anything like no, that. No, I love but... it. I, as we've talked about before, mm -hmm. I worked in that universe. I know you appreciate it too. But yeah, yeah, I'm trying to step away from it. I don't want Tolkien in it, and I, I have to reiterate this with the team often because sometimes they start going back there and say, guys, you know, do we really need that in here? I mean, how many other yeah. places can you go and find dwarves and elves and gnomes, you know, and could go walk through a dungeon with them like we just yeah. we don't need to have it or or if you're, or if we're go, if we're going to do that then do then do then do so with a with a different spin i mean yeah um, exactly you're familiar, yeah, you're familiar yeah. with the witcher well, right? let's, and let's draw let's draw on different mm -hmm. mythos i'm you know i don't know i don't want i'm sort of tired of norse things mm -hmm. um you know i mean even like the other day it was just sitting your thing man you know you know thursday is thor's day and it's like how do we still sit with all this stuff and, uh, I just use the Thor's Day thing as a joke, <laughs> <laughs> but it's real. Well, I, I I will admit that I I started using the thing as a joke sp specifically because I wanted to take the piss out of people who every December keep saying keep Christ in Christmas. I'm right? Like, yeah, you know, uh, keep the Thor and Thor's Thursday. There you yeah, go. <laughs> because, because I be and and then they and then they then they just roll my eyes and say you're an ass, and I'm like that's the nicest thing you ever said to me. <laughs> yeah well but, you know you know little things like uh you know you know amen comes from amen ra like mm -hmm. we're essentially talking about you know an uh, ancient egyptian revolt mm -hmm. but this has been like reappropriated and is like used throughout christianity like when you're communicating with god personally i find that really compelling so there's there's all of this there's this intricate web you know and you know you could you could talk about you know, I don't know. There's all kinds of people out there with conspiracy theories on it. I think it's just sort of leftovers, man. I'm sort of tired of those leftovers. And like we've been dealing, we've been dealing with them for so long. And some people are standing up to it now. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to see Confederates out there myself. My family fought against that stuff. Like, why do we, why don't we have names, na days named after traitors? Like, they shouldn't have statues. I don't want to hear about Julius Caesar anymore. Yeah. Um. I, I've, I will. I um what I do find interesting when you mention that is is certain motifs I've seen I've seen in the last few years regarding fantasy. That's um for a second ago I brought I brought up The Witcher, which um while That's it may been... use 
familiar names. It's it's very very Eastern Europe, which I think has helped um, it establish its own footprint. Hmm. Yeah. See, I honestly have never given The Witcher the really the time of day, uh, mostly because um, many of my friends worked on it, and you know, I don't know. I just. I, it's a hard, terrible thing, but I don't play games like that generally unless people pay me or I'm doing it for research. So I, I wasn't, ta- that, I wasn't I, talking about the games. Oh, but I thought that I thought the game anyway. See, I, I don't even know. Okay, but the it, the game aren't the isn't the series based on the games? No. Oh well, there you go. Before before there were the before there were the games, it was it was a um book it was a book series in Poland. Ah, okay. There you go. Um, I guess I should I should have guessed that, but no, I didn't realize that. So I thought it was all based on like the popularity of the game. To be honest, I thought that's pretty weird. It's, cool. it's, the, it's that awesome. certainly that certainly helped because okay. because before that it was just known as it was just known as a fantasy series, mainly in mainly in Poland and <laughs> and some and some other some other um, parts of Eastern Europe. But the the big thing with that appeal was the fact that it was doing fantasy but do, but doing so with a very um eastern europe ar- arguably arguably slavic um approach right, to nice. to its fantasy which is is certainly is certainly on the bleaker end of things um mm-hmm. and but um tr- but trying to compare that to to the more british style that you'd that you'd see a lot of people in the Tolkien melting pot do their app, their apples okay. and oranges. Once you get into the weeds, um, <laughs> there's al- there's also the fact that one one author who whose work I've been con- I've been consuming like a madman over the last few years has been um, Brandon Sanderson. I've recently been going through the uh, Stormlight Archive series of books, nice. and he's dr- and within that particular setting, he's. He's drawing a he's drawing a lot more influence from, um, from the mid from the Middle East and, f- and from India and so and some Polynesian aspects. Yeah, that makes me think of Empire of the Petal Throne, which mm-hmm. I can't recall if we spoke of before. Um, um, which I didn't really come into until after I got into this and like working with. I mean, I love Jeff D. Yeah, um, you in, you introduced me to him, and that's and he how... started. He sort of started talking about it, and mm-hmm. he got me into it. And I started looking. I thought, oh, well, there actually there are some similarities here. I can see that. Yeah, and I do hope I do hope that more of the um, more of the books are a- are able to be be re- be reintroduced in the world into a more affordable sense. Since for a good chunk of them, if you want if you want to get a physical copy of the books, you're gonna to have to be spending some money. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I think us collectors kind of do that these days, but, um, you know, I'm not sure a lot of the younger audience, if they even think about that, they probably just go download a PDF, right? Um, yes and no. Um, I don't want, I don't want to go fully into that because that goes, that goes a little bit too, too cynical for my style. Okay. (laughs) I, I have my I have my moments of be, uh, being a cynical asshole, but the but the key thing is their moments. Oh, all right. See, I, did, I didn't feel cynical. I just was trying to think like practically how are it's, it's more... how are how are kids essentially your younger audiences getting uh, their RPG material? And you know, I have all these folks coming at me for PDFs. I really don't want to do it. Um, oh. But you know, I guess it's part of you know the game these days, right? It 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 very much is, especially 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 given the difficulties of printing, um, mm-hmm. e- and even more so with a lot of with a lot of people that I've had on who are basically one man operations. Yeah, exactly. Um, and of course, of course, of course, what certainly helped accelerate that is the is the rise of um ver- of doing ver- of doing virtual tabletop. Which, um, some was already was already was already kind of was already kind of moving in and establishing its own footprint, um, before the pandemic happened. That just accelerated things. I'm glad that you said it like that too, because I think that that helps me think of it better. It really is like a different segment. It's virtual tabletop. It's mm-hmm. not tabletop. Right? Yeah, it's. I do. I do think. I do think that trying to, try. There are cer- there are certain there are certain advantages and disadvantages that both have. Yeah, exactly. And it's yeah. and from from my own experience, it's more of a practicality thing, so so that it can help so that I can help teach people outside mm-hmm. my outside my own particular area, and I don't have to jump around because I don't have that kind of flight money. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or you know, and for us older players, you know, we don't don't have our friends in the hood or you know whatever it is, and everybody has such a hard time getting together, and we're all so connected on the internet anyway, right? Mm-hmm. But give now, um. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to derail you there. No, 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 wor- no worries. I, ne- I never, um, I never go into these kind of kind of shows with any sort of real plan. It's just a case of here's the outline. Let's see where things go. <laughs> but I'm glad you have an outline. What? Oh, calling it an outline is a is a bit <laughs> generous. It's really a series of bullet points in my head. Oh, there you go. Okay, cool. But one thing, one thing that um. I remember you. I remember you mentioning that mentioning this, um, that you're ha- you're having some you're having some back and. F- I I don't mean I don't mean to pick on Ward, but you're having some back and forth with him about uh, about the nature of hit points and similar things. Have there have there been have there been uh, has there been a lot of um back no, and forth Jim, about I working about with Jim I- is is amazing. Um, it's such a pleasure and honor uh, to uh, be able to know uh, how his mind works, mm-hmm. and he's he's such a wealth of wisdom. Um, I really wish I frankly could take better advantage of him um, as a source of knowledge, wisdom, and talent because he is mm-hmm. he's he's really uh, just amazing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, hit points um, is something that uh, is is a good example, you know. I'm not looking to reinvent the RPG. I don't want to change it too much, um, but I have different considerations for this one. And mostly because not only do I, I honestly want it to be different. I want it, well, I want it to feel like a really solid traditional RPG. It is it's something else, particularly because I want people to dress up and run around <laughs> eventually, right? Yeah. And uh, when we get to a point where people are hanging out at a bar in giant lands and someone just went on an adventure i don't particularly want people uh uh, asking each other how many hit points they have um or you know saying well let's roll for charisma for that you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um and you know larps have looked at this a lot i don't use the term larp a lot myself um you know as i often say to people because that's a, a very particular form of game to some folks Hmm. and they have interesting ways of dealing with things and depending on the situation um so here you know i won't say that my game will make larp players happy it really is something that we're trying to do uh, differently uh, with the goal of having a space that you can enter and exist for a little while in character in giant lands Mm -hmm. now with with that kind, with that kind of thing in mind, be, be based on based on that, would it be fair would it be fair to say that you're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but you're tr- but you're trying to but you're trying to dissuade certain bad habits in yeah. um, in R- in RPG design. So so I I'd like to I'd like to run through some. I um oh, I, I don't know I, if I'll say I'll, I'll agree with you on bad habits, but I don't I, I don't know what you mean by that. But okay. Um, <laughs> well, what? Well, I'd like to. I'd like to play a bit. I'd like to play a bit of a bit of word association with okay. cer- with certain certain concepts that ha- that depending depending on the game and and especially especially some games more than others. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this idea that you have to have these things. Right. Um, if you if you don't if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go for it. Sounds good. Um, so. I'll start. So I'll start. I'll start out with an easy one. Classes. Uh, no. I mean, I guess we're supposed to be doing. It. You know, I, I was just gonna do a random uh, free word association, which I, my, you know, my brain does that too easily. Mm-hmm. No, we don't have classes. We have uh, professions. Um, so no, I don't like the word class. Um, I also um, don't really like the class system as it exists in most rpgs so no players uh can pursue professions Mm -hmm. should i say player characters can pursue professions yeah um i now this is this is this one this next one is is particular to to a lot to a lot of old school games but the the idea of the idea of of rolling to hit or miss. Mhm. Yeah. Um I looked at that a lot. Um 
but yes, you still will be rolling to hit or miss, and not all strikes uh, will be guaranteed. Well, what I what I mean by what I mean by that, and especially with the miss part of it, is mm -hmm. is it be is it there's been there's been some criticism over over the years about the idea of a missed roll just being a narrative stop. Oh, like it. Right. I mean, I never took it that way. I mean, there's so many things like that. I look at particularly the way the you know the the wizards uh, of the coast D and D five E community is really interesting, um, and how they th how they have this perception. And forgive me for blanketing, um, but there seems to be this perception that games have to be like run a certain way, or that there's like really hard fast rules. So that would be a good example. I don't know. I as I always took it into play um, when you hit, missed. It wasn't um, it wasn't as if you know, it didn't happen in game. It's simply a strike that didn't hit. And so, yeah, that could be a great cue uh, for any number of uh, additional events, right? Yeah. Um, is, that, is that what you're saying? Well, I was, I was, I was kind, I was kind of dipping into the concept of, of, um, fa of fail forward, i.e. a failed, a failed roll doesn't necessarily mean that the narrative momentum stops. Um, mm -hmm. It keep it keeps going. Um, you can do you can do you can do other things than sim than simply si than simply say, oh you did yo you didn't hit. Yeah, you're, um, yeah, you're making me think that there's like um, there's probably a language I don't know out there mm -hmm. um, that it sounds like you have that is sort of DM or GM kind of um, drama speak. Um, and so, yeah, it's hard. I don't, I don't think I know that very well anymore. I mean, I used to run games a long time ago. I work in it as a profession now. Um, so, yeah, uh, the idea that it would stop the flow of play doesn't make sense. I mean, that would be like a bad game master that would make that happen. Um, I, just, I guess you could have games where they would, you know, act like, you know, the only way to um grind is up if you will um but yeah that doesn't make a lot of sense to me and um you know i'm not interested in swashbuckling and to be perfectly honest um as much as there is a lot of combat um you know i'm trying not to make combat a, a central focus um, i'm more interested in sort of exploration mm -hmm. um and and discovery all right and get Given given what given what you mentioned with that that um that brings me that brings me to something else and that is the concept of levels. Mm -hmm. There is no leveling, um, except in the context of your profession. Um, professions can only be leveled to a ten, actually, and that's when you're considered a master. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to stay at that level um, if you'd like, or you can pursue another profession. Um, in which you do maintain uh, some of your skills from previous professions, um, but you're not considered a master of that profession anymore. Yeah. Um, species, or, mm -hmm. or the idea, or the idea that a, that a player character's choice of species plays a significant factor in um, in what they're able to do. Yeah, I don't know about significant, um, but this is. You know, uh, I'm almost want to think of um, something that was taught to me by this, uh, one of my teachers, Tracy Fullerton, uh, when I was at USC. And, you know, I guess it sort of comes from Eric Zimmerman as well. What was it? Um, you can, like, oh, I'm not going to be able to get the quote right. Forgive me. It's something about, like, you can add a rule. I'm not going to be able to get it out. Anyway. But there's no point to dressing it more unless it has effect on the system, right? So, um, yes, your species does have effect on your abilities. All, all right. So, now I, I would have mentioned now, stuff. Now, Go ahead. now it's, and this is mm -hmm. part of why we draw. You know, we hope players will choose different species uh, as player characters because they think they're building a character that has a certain you know, character to it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is uh, informed. Um, by their characteristics, uh, one of which is their species. Yeah. Um, crit criticals. Criticals slash fumbles. Mm -hmm. Big fan. 
And it doesn't have to be the it doesn't have to be the traditional critical hit. You roll this amount and you do double damage or something like that. But but merely the idea that something extra happens if you manage this um, this one particular roll that has a low that has a low probability. Whether that's something yeah. extra for or against you, the point is something extra happens. Yeah, I just keep thinking of one of my favorite games ever, um, Dragon Warrior Two. <laughs> and I tell you, man. You know, these days it's Dragon Quest, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, one of my favorite moments as a kid. And yeah, that's a CRPG, but um, uh, I don't you know, discriminate. <laughs> you know, when you when you uh, get that, you know, extra bonus to your strike, and it makes that extra little sound, you're like, I mean, it really is rewarding as a player. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's a little random. So I love random. I'm a big fan of random, um, but I've I've tried to balance the sensibilities because. Um, a lot of players come to the RPG with war game sensibilities, and they want to crunch it. They want to crunch it a lot. So I don't know. I've I've really tried to play it both ways. Yeah. I don't know. It won't make everyone happy, um, but um, you know, and we're dealing with that now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, particularly because you know we're an independent project. So it's, you know, a passion project that, uh, you know, now has some interest behind it, which is great, but you know, really who, who are we building the game for? I didn't think that I would get so many of these older guys like ourselves, uh, interested in this stuff. I didn't realize they were such a vocal community. You know, I really hope that it get, gets to some kids out there. I hope some kids love this stuff. So, um, but, where I've had to go in the course of product development is really try to make them all happy, you know, and in some ways I'm trying to please that inner child uh, mm -hmm. within us um, and hoping that that is the same as contemporary kids. Cause at the end of the day, you know, I want this to be son that something that like my son likes to play with his friends really, um, you know, it's, they're all, you know, just finishing elementary school at the beginning of junior high, you know, same age when I fell in love with this stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, um, and that's, that's first and foremost, the audience that I'm aiming at. So, uh, you know, we're working through those things right now. Uh, how, you know, some, some places, um, there's a little too much math still happening. Um, you know, we've tried to do, to reduce that, um, to make it something that people are comfortable with. I am very comfortable with math. Um, but, you know, um, we need to make it a system that um, is, uh, shall I say, explicit uh, to people and they understand how it works. And one of those things is to try to make it a simple system. Now, part of uh, the challenge I also have is, you know, I'm using Mayan numerology as well. Um, so I'm trying to teach people to read numbers a little differently. Um, and then we also have, you know, a decent amount of math happening. Mm -hmm. um, this is why I've moved away from percentile. I mean, I don't know. Percentile as people talk about it in games, like at first it made a lot of sense to me or I thought I understood it. But the more I got into it, I thought, wow, there's just all this bad math. Like if I was a math teacher, I would not be happy with all of this. <laughs> I, um, I've got enough, I've got nothing against percentile. I mean, I've played, I've gone. Well, no, if it's, done, if it's done right. But I think a lot of times that you start looking at things and, you're, you know, you're talking about multiplying, you know, percentages and things like that. I was like, well, what are we talking about now? Are we actually talking about percentage or are we just talking about like a D100 system, right? Um, a bit, a, lo a little bit of both, a little bit of both some sometimes. Yeah, but, right. Exactly. But um, I, I will acknowledge that one one particular flaw that can happen with with those kind of systems is that they can get a little bit swingy. Yeah, they, that, that's a good way to, to, to say it. I think you've used that term before. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh, one of my favorite systems I ever developed was a 2D10 system because it reduced that swinginess and really gave a really nice curve to outcomes um, that uh, I felt better about. Um, so, um, yeah, we're, we've got a great editor on it now. And what's nice about working with a classic, um, you know, game editor that's done work with uh, White Wolf and TSR and all these folks um, and, and more uh, is um, they come to the material, not just as sort of a, uh, um, you know, kind of a traditional literary editor, mm -hmm. but they re she's really looking at the game systems too. So we're like, in, we're in the, in the roles. I keep saying that 
in in the uh, you know in the trenches of, of really kind of wrestling this stuff out to nail it down now. So it's mm-hmm. it's good. It's 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 exciting. So um, um, you know, one of my big things is man, I don't know, man. Like, what's that? What's an RPG without a D twenty? You know what I mean? A lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, lot, a lot of them. But like, I tell you, one of my favorite things that I've experienced over this, because I sort of got over it, you know, was uh, hanging out with Ernie playing his hobby shop dungeon. Mm-hmm. Um, he just had so many dice. And I remembered how much I loved having all kinds of dice. And, you know, it's sometimes it's fun to bring out that D4, you know? Um, yeah. So, um, although um, one of my, one of my roommates um, did not, did not like me using D4s as an, in an act of revenge once. Oh no. Um, <laughs> Because he he um he had he had you mean in like real life? Oh yeah, <laughs> um, they are sort of like tax. Well, yeah. That, well, that that brings me to exactly what happened because he because he decided to have he decided to have um some he decided to have my stock of skier that I had been that I had been that I had been saving for my lunches, and um I ended I ended up my, I ended up turning the ki- turning the kitchen floor into a minefield by just. By just lay by just laying down a laying down a, a about a hundred d fours. So imagine walking at, walking on that at six in the morning when 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 they're all they're all what they're all white d fours with bla- with black numbers, and the t- the the kitchen floor has white tiles. <laughs> You're not gonna steal from me again, are you? <laughs> right. Um. Sounds like it worked, I guess. Oh. It, I'm I'm of the, I'm of the opinion that if I, that if I really want to send a message to, to not do something, it should be it should be sent in the most vile, painful, ridiculous method possible. So the mere thought of trying that stunt again is is too is too much to take. Um, in the case of cheaters at my table, that's why I have the pain glass or the bottle of bacon soda. <laughs> like you, if if you get caught cheating, you got to you've got to drink. Right. Um. Bacon soda, for the record, is absolutely horrid. I, I don't know, man. I, you know, grew up drinking it for antacids. So. <laughs> well, it tastes like carbonated bacon grease. I'll put it that way. Uh, that's gross. It's definitely not not a good flavor, but it's giving me some relief sometimes. When I can... Yeah, but one of one other um one other key, one other thing that I'm that I'm curious about that I'm curious about in your design space is the is the concept. Of, and you've kind of mentioned this. You kind of went into this when it came to um, leveling professions, but the idea of horizontal versus vertical um, development. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you fe- how do you feel about? Would you do you need me to clarify what I mean by that, or could you tell yeah, me? Yeah, you... yeah. No, go ahead. I think I know what you're aiming at, but no. Go um, ahead. A lot of a lot of leveling a lot of systems that have an outright leveling um, setup. Mm-hmm. Have a have a very ver, have a very vertical um, development setup. The idea the idea is your the idea is you have you have a set of things at the start, and you are getting better and better at those set as those set things, as you quote unquote level up. Whether mm-hmm. that's the actual term, it doesn't whether you act, whether the game actually has a leveling system in that sense or, or not. Um, horizontal development is. It is your adv- your advancement is you is you get is you getting a wider pool of things you can do, mm-hmm. um, and some ge- some games go something like say D- something like say D and D is ver- is very much a vertical development um, setup. No, no, I, no, I understand where we are now. Whereas so, like, I, mean, so, I thought mm-hmm. I thought that's you, what you're getting at. So, I mean, when I think of the vertical, I think of the grind. Um, and I really don't want the grind uh, yeah. in this game, and I'm not very interested in it. You know, I the grind well. isn't the grind isn't really a factor of horizontal versus vertical. It's more okay. it's more about what it's more about what you're getting out of the development. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I would I would say that you know uh, for for the model as presented, yeah, it's it's much more uh, horizontal than than vertical. Mm-hmm. Um. So, given that, given that, would it be fair of me to say that um, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to professions, somebody who somebody who 
you could have two people who start who start at the same profession at at for I'm just going to use first rank instead of first level because connotations. Mm -hmm. But by the time they're at tenth, they may they may end up they may end up taking having taken different paths and have a diff and have different pools of what they can do. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, particularly because professions are almost I mean they are important, um, but they're not uh, as important as say in a class system um, when it's really you know uh, almost everyone's a magic user uh, in giant lands. Uh, because now you don't have to take a sigil um, and you don't have to pursue a, a particular path uh, in terms of uh, sigil magic, but um, it uh, is, is something that's sort of key to the world. Um, and uh, that's really uh, where your growth, where your growth is, is, is in your harnessing of different lay energies. Mm -hmm. Now, this is this isn't exactly a quick term, but it but it is it is it is something it is something that I've kind I've kind of touched on because it's it's certainly been a sticking point for me for years. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is that is the that is the divide between that is the divide in ability between those who can, who can use supernatural abilities, with magic or otherwise, and those who can't. Um, right. TV Tropes calls this Linear Warriors Quadratic Wizards. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've tried to I've tried to eliminate that that dichotomy. Yeah, the the big the big this is this is one this is one of those issues that um, in in certain in certain games, um, fantasy games especially, and especially games that. Ha that have that have some detail that have some detail with a magic system. Um, this can, this can sometimes be an issue where the amount the amount of cho the amount of choices and the pool of what someone can do um, as a ca as a caster archetype versus someone who is versus someone who is not the whole warrior wiz wizard divide um, has has one of them clearly above the others and in extreme cases. You can you can have it where a where a where certain caster archetypes are entire parties unto themselves the same way, um, the same way Superman could be in could be entire groups of superheroes all by himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess we could say that that sort of does exist, really, because we don't have wizards; we have technologists, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, not. Um, all professions are as adept at the lay technology. Yeah, but I don't. But I don't think you'd. I don't think you'd be setting it up where a, where a party needs to have a technologist. No, but um, it well, it sort of depends on the adventure. So mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, that's actually a big piece of it is that it is sort of like a puzzle, and yeah, you need to pay attention to your party. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, just like picking a good team. And uh, yeah, you want to have a, a balance there because you might encounter situations that require things um, from particular professions um, or that particular professions would make a lot easier for you. I, I can certainly I can certainly get um, get behind that kind of, get behind that kind of thing. Um, and this so is why we, I try to um at least within the context of how the game is written you know put a lot of it on the spirit keeper which is what we call our game master in giant lands mm -hmm. and say actually you know this is between you and your spirit keeper and um because for different adventures you know it might be different and uh, i know that that's the way we used to play it um you know there is that time when you're kind of you're on your own and you're just developing cool characters but you know a lot of times it's hey i'm gonna run an adventure why don't you make a character and, you know, building that with a person who's going to run the adventure and, you know, can help you make that character in with considerations that would help it out with that, that adventure. Right? Mm -hmm. And with that, with that kind of, with that kind of thing in mind, um, 
Now, put, putting as, putting aside the lightning round that I, that I gave, um, how do you how do you would you, given the fact that you're trying to emphasize exploration more than more than combat, um, would it be fair to say that you, that that um, Giant Lands is a game that favors, uh, or at least not favors, but support but supports um, hex crawling, like hex crawl style play. Yeah, for sure. Um, which it which is is good because well for one, um, hex crawling is a is a very un, is a very underrated um st- style of play, even for somebody like me who. Who, te- who tends to who tends to structure his ca- his campaigns almost like almost like a making a short TV show, not in the sense of giving everybody a script or anything like that, but having having a three act structure and how I do it. Yeah, it's great. So I mean, um, yeah, it ships with a hex map. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, the big influences uh, for this. Um, our hex maps. I um, mean, I have some of the original Gamma World he- hex maps in my possession now, which is sort of crazy. Um, uh, made by uh, Kimber Eastland, my advisor, um, my late advisor. And um, yeah, so one of the fun things is we do have different styles of terrain, and you encounter different sorts of creatures in different terrain. And so when you get you see a particular hex that is of a particular terrain you can sort of expect what you might be finding there, particularly if you're in a certain region, blah, 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 blah. And a lot of that comes from these cool flow charts um, that uh, players from of Jim's material uh, might be familiar with. So, yeah, I mean, the system, there's a system in there for both players um, to help understand where they are and for uh, the game master to help uh, run it as a believable world. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of it for me comes out of, uh, my, um, training and production design, uh, from cinema really. And this is what I do a lot of times, uh, in video games, although I do it from a, a storytelling perspective. So how do you design a whole production to have audio visual cues, um, that build a language that communicates with their audience, with your audience so that. You know, uh, 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 this is a bad example um, because it's so cliche. But when you see a, a red light, you know, and this could you could redefine it for your production. It doesn't have to mean that you're safe, right? Um, it could mean that you're you're in danger because suddenly suddenly there's a, a, a saturation of red light, right? And this is a device that we see used a lot in games and various games. Or, or or suddenly there's a blue friendly light, right? And these, this eventually, in the context of a particular experience, builds a language so that people that are familiar with it will start to ingest those cues. And they might not, they might not do it consciously, um, which is so remarkable about this witchcraft. Uh, but it, our minds just sort of start doing it naturally. And you know, some um, masters are are particularly um, good. Uh, with these uh, sorts of things, um, you know, for some reason, the, the use of the color red in the film, The Machinist, um, is, is popping out to me right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, so you can create a language um, that informs players as well on th- of things like stats, um, uh, force quality, area effects. Um, the same kind of things we sort of had to start doing when we were started making, you know, like real-time strategy games and stuff. And, you know, as games become more visceral, um, I think, at least in video games, um, you know, we have to kind of make these things, you know, the fog of war um, and things of these nature that uh, end up uh, actually becoming devices that communicate very sort of gamey concepts to our players without us having to say, hey, he's got this many th- hit points, or look, he's prone, you know, or well, mm-hmm. obviously he's fucking prone, right? Yeah. Um, and with with all that with all that in mind, to to kind of wrap thing to kind of wrap everything together in a neat little bow, um do you have do you have any do you have any plans to put to put out say a say a quick start or a, or a system preview or some or something similar in the in the coming year? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, it's it's so hard, uh, you know, although we've gotten a lot of visibility, we're still very much an independent project, right? Mm-hmm. 
and um, trying to find that balance between, hey, we don't want to give our game away uh, between uh, versus, hey, we also want people to get interested in it is, is hard. So um, where um, we are right now is the idea is I'll probably be giving away um, a free adventure that Jim's developed uh, that we've run at some conventions. Um, that'll probably be a free downloadable uh, for people as well as uh, character sheets and some basic rules so they can get started. All right. And I'll, I'll start. Do you, um, are you thinking of, are you thinking of doing that sometime around free RPG day or Gen Con or something like that? Oh, I don't, when's free RPG day? I don't even know. Um, let me check. I mean, I've only, I've only did free comic book day. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I'm allowed to go to Gen Con. I'm not sure. I, I've sort of tried to stay away from a lot of the bad press and the press at all that we get because they say not to read it. But I think I've been banned from a lot of places, which is sort of sad. Um, but, you know, it'll get fixed in time. I'm not sure if they really banned me or Giant Lands or just TSR. I'm not real sure. So I'm not sure if I'll be, ever be back to Gen Con, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, as for... Um... The next free RPG day is Octo is October sixteenth. Oh, okay, yeah, that I mean that actually works really well too, um, because yeah, that's that's sort of the window when we I hopefully they'll start arriving before that. I want to make sure that this box arrives first in my Kickstarter backers' hands, mm -hmm. and after it arrives in their hands, all the people that have pre-ordered it, um, and then yes, I will uh, be releasing that. So that actually sounds like a, a great. Uh, date to hit thanks um yeah. uh, for for releasing it all right um and also i'll certainly be keeping a close eye on how on how everything develops thanks but with all that said i would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and of course braving the hell of time zones to come come back to the temple well actually i think we're in the same time zone i didn't want to break it too <laughs> Um, space is warped, time is bendable, and I, and I, well, to, to say, I would say that time zones are my mortal enemy, but then I'd have to add, meanwhile, what, meanwhile, water is wet, the sky is blue, humans need oxygen to survive, and Jimmy Hoffa's cur cur and Jimmy Hoffa's um, body has never been found. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to deal with a team, it's like, say, tomorrow I have a phone call with, uh, this death metal team that I, I, or band, a team, mm -hmm. I call them team all the time. Uh, a death metal band from Singapore. They're 13 hours ahead across the date line, so um, I can try to go to bed early so I can wake up and talk to them tomorrow. Wait, it'll be t it'll be tomorrow night, but it'll be tomorrow morning here. So, yes. um, get stronger coffee, <laughs> dude. I'm trying to quit coffee. I think I'm going back to yerba mate. Well, get stronger yerba mate. <laughs> For sure. Either that, either that, or just have a spoonful of monk fruit. That that'll cer that'll certainly get your attention. Ah uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, I thanks so much, Mildo. It's, it's uh, been great uh, talking to you again. Yep. And thanks and, for having me back at the temple. It's always great to be here. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>